Hey guys, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Game of Thrones Season 6, Episode 6, Blood of My Blood. And I know I'm not Philip, he's still recovering, so I'm gonna fill in for him again this week. But we did talk a lot about the episode, and I feel like I did all my homework and broke everything down. I'm gonna get to the rest of the episode in just a bit, but these opening shots are just packed with missable details, so let's get right to it with the opening images. So just like they were at the end of last episode, Bran and Mira are on the run, and Bran is still trapped in this green seer trance. He's connected to the old three Raven. But now that he's dead, all this crucial need-to-know information from the old man is downloading into Bran's mind, because Bran is the new Three-Eyed Raven. So everything we're seeing is like Bran's own personal previously on Game of Thrones montage. And these images fly at us so fast, and yes, we did go through this frame by frame, and I feel like I could be the Three-Eyed Raven now, so let's just go into it. We get two quick frames of these pyromancers carefully storing wildfire underneath King's Landing. Remember, wildfire is that super flammable green liquid that Tyrion used to torture Stannis' fleet in the Battle of Blackwater, they keep it in these round clay pots. And wildfire keeps coming up throughout these visions, and I'll talk more about it when it comes up later. Then we get a shot of a flying dragon, followed by that image of a dragon shadow over King's Landing. So already in a few frames, we're seeing two ways that King's Landing could be destroyed by fire, from below and from above. And remember, King's Landing wasn't a full constructed city yet when the dragons of the Targaryen family were flying around back in the old days. So this image that we're seeing right now is from the future. And I think those wildfire shots that we saw before could also be from the future, but that's a theory that I'll get to later on. Then quickly we get our first ever look at the Mad King Aerys Targaryen, father to Daenerys. Now this is the king who Jaime Lannister murdered to become the Kingslayer. It's the same king that Robert Baratheon replaced on the Iron Throne. And check out how Aerys' crown is the shape of flames. Now fire is obviously the brand of the Targaryen family, just like antlers are the brand of the Baratheons. That's why they have antler-shaped crowns. Now the Mad King was obsessed with wildfire. He actually ordered a massive batch of it to be made and stored underneath King's Landing just so it could be set ablaze as the Lannister army invaded the city. That would have burned everyone alive, but the Mad King thought it would turn him into a dragon to defeat his enemies. That's why Jaime killed him and why people call this guy the Mad King. And right after we see a Mad King who wanted to burn his enemies, we see the visual opposite of that image, the Icy Night King, the new biggest threat to Westeros. This shot of him bringing back corpses as White's at Hardhome keeps going back throughout the montage, so I'll come back to it. Then we return to that iconic shot of Bran falling from the broken tower in Winterfell that ended the first episode of the series and began Bran's journey as a green seer. And like in all of these shots, Bran isn't seeing this from his own perspective. He actually wasn't there for a lot of these other visions. Bran is seeing this from our eyes, the audience. Now, since Bran is the new Three-Eyed Raven, his vision of the world isn't just through his own eyes anymore. He's actually an all-knowing, omniscient perspective. So Bran's crash course through the history of Westeros continues with images of the deaths of his mother and father, the birth of Daenerys' dragons, the Night King and the baby, and they all repeat it again and again with this shot of the dragon. So how is this all connected? Well, Bran is seeing the big picture of the conflict of Westeros. The White Walkers threatening to destroy the world with ice, and the Targaryens threatening to destroy it with fire, a song of ice and fire. But also, Bran is connected to his parents here, and that's because the Stark family bloodline is important. Remember, the Starks are one of the only families of the North who still pray to the old gods. And now that we see Bran have these powers and become the Three-Eyed Raven, there's something to the old gods. They actually have some validity in this world. So I'll bring up the importance of the Stark family bloodline and all family bloodlines in Game of Thrones as we continue. Bran's second round of visions takes us back to some of those images that we've already seen, plus this shot of Raven swarming at us, followed by roots. I think this is meant to reestablish Bran's new role as the Three-Eyed Raven, and these roots show that Bran is still mentally connected to the weirwood roots that allowed him to see through time. But also, the Ravens could be a reference to another character who, in the books, commands a flock of ravens. That person's about to make his entrance, but uh, more on him in just a second. Then we return to that shot of the pyromancers beneath King's Landing, pouring all the wildfire into these pots. As we hear the Mad King scream, Burn them all! Those were the Mad King's last words, his command to torch King's Landing with wildfire, and it's pretty terrifying, but I think in this vision, burn them all might have a different meaning, but hold that thought. But first, why does Bran see the wildfire explode? The Mad King's order was never carried out, remember? The, obviously the city's not a big pile of ash now. My first thought was that this is a hypothetical version of events, like if the Mad King did burn down King's Landing. But remember, last episode we talked about how Game of Thrones seems to be using a version of time travel with one timeline. There are no alternate possibilities. Everything happens. That's why I think these wildfire flames are from a future that we haven't seen yet. And this green explosion could just be part of another massive wildfire detonation like the one we saw at Blackwater. So Jamie murdering the Mad 
King on the Iron Throne is one of the most famous events of Game of Thrones, and it's awesome that we actually get to see it happen. We've seen Jamie talk about it in two critical scenes, once with Ned Stark in season one, when it was considered a traitorous move. You're a servant of justice. But you were avenging my father when you shoved your sword in Aerys Targaryen's back. Tell me, if I stabbed the Mad King in the belly instead of the back, would you admire me more? And then another time with Brienne back in season three when Jamie emotionally defended his actions. Tell them all he kept saying. Tell me if your precious Brandy commanded you to kill your own father and stand by while thousands of men, women, and children burned alive, would you have done it? Would you have kept your oath then? And now, seeing it objectively from Bran's eyes, we know both versions are kind of true in their own ways. That white cape that Jaime wears means he's a king's guard. He's sworn to protect the Mad King, not kill him. But it's also clear that Jaime is saving thousands of lives by killing this madman. Then Bran returns to the Tower of Joy, and we hear Ned ask, Where's my sister? And right after this shot, we get a hand covered in blood. That's probably Ned's hand. The sleeve matches up with the armor he was wearing in the Tower of Joy. But who is this other person? Now, the other hand looks female, making this most likely Lyanna Stark, but check out that massive cut wound. Now, the theory with Lyanna Stark suggests that she died by giving birth to the baby Jon Snow, but this wound complicates that story. But uh, regardless, it's clear that the Stark family bloodline plays an important role in all of Bran's visions. So we see more of this Kingslayer sequence with Jaime double tapping the Mad King. He told Brienne that he was worried that the king would actually come back as a dragon. I don't think he expected to die. He reborn as a dragon turn his enemies to ash. I slit his throat to make sure that didn't happen. In her cut with the Kingslayer killing the king and sitting on the Iron Throne in that classic image Ned Stark arrived to, we see another king getting betrayed and stabbed, the King in the North, Rob Stark. So along with Bran's father and his mother's death, as well as his Aunt Lyanna, maybe, seeing his brother's death is another moment where the Stark family bloodline is coming back. These visions are bringing together all of the Starks and all of their blood getting spilled. And through all these images, the Mad King saying, Burn them all! continues to echo throughout, like a chorus. And notice how it plays over the shots of the children of the forest creating the first White Walker, who we now know is the same actor who plays the Night King, and the shot of Jon Snow fighting the White Walker at Hardhome. But what does Burn Them All have to do with these images? Just like Hold the Door had a double meaning in Bran's vision last episode, I think Bran could be hearing Burn Them All as a solution to deal with the White Walkers. Now, I know that normal fire only destroys whites and White Walkers appear to be immune to it, but what about wildfire? And what about the fire from a dragon, which Bran keeps seeing in these visions too? If dragon glass can create and destroy White Walkers, maybe Burn Burning them all with wildfire or dragonfire could be the key to destroying them for good. Now, this next shot happens so fast you might have missed it. There's a pair of shadows on the wall, probably belonging to Jamie and the Mad King, but look at these shapes. It, it might just be me, but the Mad King's shadow kind of looks like a dragon here. Now, obviously, we're pretty sure the Mad King didn't have any real dragon power, but he scared Jamie enough to make him think that he could have. Just like Varys' riddle that we brought up a few episodes back. Power resides where men believe it resides. It's a trick, a shadow on the wall. Power in Game of Thrones is all about who casts the biggest shadow on the wall. And the Mad King, as crazy as he was, cast a pretty spooky shadow. The final shots of Bran's vision really tie together the Mad King with the White Walkers. You can even see the swords of the Iron Throne that the Mad King is sitting on, matching up visually with the spikes of the Hardhome gates as they collapse. So these White Walkers are a huge threat to Westeros. But it's like these visions are saying, Burn them all! And as the Mad King knew all along, one way to deal with them, and perhaps the only way to deal with them is to burn them all, which we hear one last time faintly as the Night King grabs Bran. Okay, fine, I am done with these. Let's move on and burn them all. So that mark from the Night King is probably why Bran says to Mira the moment he wakes up, They found us. So that mark really is a permanent curse. Wherever Bran goes, Whites and White Walkers will be close behind. But we get this amazing rescue sequence from a character we predicted might show up this episode, Cold Hands. Well, kind of. He rides a horse instead of an elk, and he uses this flaming mace to take out the Whites. That's probably the most effective weapon we've seen used against them. But no Notice the blackened tips of his fingers. Yep, that is definitely cold hands. But also look at his eyes. This episode saves the reveal for later.
later, but you can already tell that is Benjen Stark. So even though George R. R. Martin denied the cold hands Benjen theory in the notes and the margins, this show is moving forward with it. So now moving on, we get this great tonal shift from cold hands horse escaping a cold winter nightmare to this other horse galloping into a green summer paradise. This is the Tarly family home of Horn Hill. Horn Hill is located in the Reach that's southwest of King's Landing, and just like Gilly, we've never seen this region in the show before. All of these new colors are mind blowing for Gilly, and she gazes out the coach window just like the ship porthole back in episode three. And I love how Sam just lists off tree names. It kind of sounds like Bubba talking about shrimp and Forrest Gump. Maple, Elm, Beach, Poplar, Shrimp Kebabs, Shrimp Creole, Lemon Shrimp. Coconut shrimp. And I know it's kind of dumb and it might just be the Forrest Gump connection I noticed, but Sam has a lot in common with Forrest Gump. He's obviously a lot smarter, but he is also an unlikely hero and a surprisingly good father who makes it a lot farther than anyone expected. And his love for Gilly feels a lot like Forrest's love for his love, Jenny. Forrest isn't an ideal man, but he's loyal and dependable, just like Sam is. Notice how Sam tells Gilly that summer's gone. And of course, now that summer's over, you'll start seeing the autumn colors coming in. That could be a reference to Summer, Bran's direwolf, dying in the last episode. So even though these two have arrived in a warm, summery place, winter is still coming, and the protections of Summer won't last much longer. So the story that Sam plans to lie to his family with is that the little Sam is his bastard son. But it's interesting that that is the same story that, according to the theory, Ned Stark told to protect the baby Jon Snow. And considering how Jon Snow's mother ended up it makes me a little worried for Gilly. I hope she doesn't die. Wait a minute, didn't Jenny from Forrest Gump also die at the end of the movie? Uh, okay, I need to stop thinking about Gilly dying. It's depressing me. Moving on. We meet Sam's mother, Lady Melissa Tarly, and his sister Tala. And it's kind of a relief how warm and welcoming the mother is, uh, considering most of the other noble ladies that we've met on the show end up being cold or insane. And the fact that Sam's father, Lord Randall Tarly, and his little brother, Dickon, aren't there to greet him is a major slight. Melissa says they're off hunting, which is the sigil of the house Tarly, a red huntsman on a field of green. And speaking of mothers, we move on to the Sept of Baylor, where we see Tommen lighting a candle at the foot of the mother statue. That's the God of Mercy. The Mother's Mercy is what allows for these walks of atonement for repentant sinners like Marjorie and Cersei. Mother's Mercy is actually the name of the last season finale when Cersei did her walk of shame. Mercy will come up in relation to Cersei later on this episode. But notice how when Cersei gets mentioned, we cut to this perspective shot from the mother statue's eyeline. Tommen is literally in the eyes of the Seven right now, and he fears that all of his actions are being watched. No other king that we've seen on Game of Thrones has feared and respected the gods this much. So so it foreshadows what's going to happen later with Tommen and the High Sparrow. And all of this is because the High Sparrow is a master manipulator who has Tommen wrapped around his finger. Check out how he scolds Tommen for raising his voice at him just with the harsh look. Of course I'm afraid for her. And even though it goes over Tommen's head, he totally threatens him in this moment. It seems like the High Sparrow knows the Lannisters and the Tyrells are planning something. And just like he used Loras to manipulate Marjorie, letting Tommen speak to Marjorie is the same kind of power play. He knows seeing Marjorie in her current mental state will persuade Tommen to go along with his plan to get both the king and queen under the High Sparrow's control. And it all seems to work. Marjorie appears to be fully reformed, plain and humble as a saint, convincing Tommen that she likes the High Sparrow and that she agrees that her brother is a sinner. But does anyone else call bullshit here? Back in episode three, Loras asked her to make the suffering stop. And I feel like all this saintly behavior, a sister act, if you will, is just a ploy to free herself and her brother. She knows she can't do anything from inside a prison cell. So I think Marjorie has decided to play into Tommen's grandfather complex with the High Sparrow and act like one big happy family. And then when Marjorie says, the gods have a plan for us all. I think Marjorie is talking about her own secret plans. Moving on. Back in Hornhill, I love this she's all that reveal with Gilly dressed up for dinner. She even stumbles a bit. But this whole scene plays out like another comedy, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, with Gilly as a fish out of water in the noble Tarly household. Now, Lord Randall Tarly is Sam's asshole dad. Remember, he forced Sam to renounce his title and join the Night's Watch, or he would kill him. So uh, if you had a dad who just made you play sports that you hated, you could have had this father of the year. Lord Tarly is also a proud warrior. He actually forced Robert Baratheon to retreat during the Battle of Ashford and Robert's Rebellion. But Robert went on to win the war anyway and rule 
him. And I think by spending all of his time deer hunting and using these deer antlers to prop up the Valyrian steel sword Heartsbane, it's like Lord Tarly uses hunting stags as a way to make up for the Baratheon stag he let get away. Sam's relationship with his father reminds me of Tyrion's relationship with his father, Tywin Lannister. Both fathers are old, proud lords who don't respect how smart their sons are, judging them for their less than ideal bodies and disowning them. Both sons are also pushed to the point of betraying their old men. Tyrion killed Tywin, and Sam does the next best thing. He steals Randall's precious sword like it's an autographed baseball bat. So what does this mean that Sam has Heartsbane now? This is actually kind of a smart move for Sam. Lord Tarly is probably too proud to admit that his doughy outcast son stole his precious ancient family sword, so he really can't send anyone after him. And Valerian Steel is better off in Sam's hands than Dickens anyway. Sam has killed a White Walker before, and Dickens doesn't even think they exist, and come on, his name is Dickens. So I don't know if we're gonna see Sam in the Citadel in Old Town after all. It seems like the show has different plans for his journey, because giving an underestimated loser a great sword is kind of a classic step in the story arc for a great warrior. So we move on from one Valyrian Steel sword to a prop version of another famous Valyrian Steel sword, Lion's Tooth, Joffrey's sword, cutting through the purple wedding cake wielded by that kid with the genital wart problem. Now, like her brother Bran at the top of this episode, Arya is also witnessing historical events that she wasn't there for. And while she watched with sadness last episode as the crowd laughed at her father's execution, this time it's the opposite. She's cracking up. Again, Arya is totally out of touch with the mainstream view of history. But Arya's smile fades as she connects with the grief Lady Crane shows on stage. After Arya lost her father, she's gone from victim to vengeful killer, but she hasn't really shown any real empathy until now. It's interesting that after years of seeing brutal violence firsthand, it takes an act of theater to change Arya's heart. So like Bran, it's only when Arya steps back from the drama and looks at the big picture that she can understand what it all really means. When Arya sneaks backstage to poison Lady Crane's rum, check out this shot of her with the Iron Throne prop framing her in the background and the wooden Ned Stark head in the foreground. Now, last episode we said that this play was a test for Arya to see if she could put aside her Stark family ties and carry out the mission without question. But the bloodline is strong, and her father's sense of justice is still inside her. Now, whoever sits on the Iron Throne decides for themselves who lives and who dies. And just like her father did when he sat on the Iron Throne as Hand of the King, Arya is now feeling empowered to decide what is just mission be damned. Arya's unexpected conversation with Lady Crane reveals how similar their stories are. Both of them left home at a young age, never looking back, to join a group who wear false identities. Arya with the faceless men, and Lady Crane with the stage actors. And when Arya describes how she would change the narrative of history, we see that she's still hung up over having someone she loved taken from her. Vengeance is still in her heart. But notice how right in this moment, Lady Crane asks what Arya's name is, and this is just like the test Jack and Hagar gave her. The correct answer is, a girl has has no name. But this time, Arya gets the test, and she has a new answer. Mercy. Arya has already made up her mind. The first thing on her mind isn't loyalty to the Faceless Men, it's having mercy on a person she thinks is being unjustly targeted. Then Arya's immediate next line? My father's waiting for me. She's talking about her real father, Ned Stark, and the Stark bloodline that she's now returning to. So naturally, Arya retrieves her sword, Needle, proving that inside she was a Stark all along. And for the first time ever, we see Jack and Agar peel off a dead man's face to make a mask. And that's one step of the process that always eluded Arya. We never got to see it. And this is kind of an unmasking for the Faceless Men, too. Now we know all their secrets and they aren't so mysterious anymore, so they've lost some of their appeal. Arya is ready to leave them behind and so are we. And this shot of Arya in this vast, dark place is interesting. We don't know where this is because obviously Arya can't return to the House of Black and White now, but she's surrounded by darkness. Remember, Arya began the season blind, terrified of the darkness, but now, by blowing out the candle, she embraces the darkness, no longer fearful of being on her own in a dark world. Moving on to King's Landing, where Cersei and Jaime's plan to use the Tyrell army to take out the Faith Militant is underway. There is a moment during Mace Tyrell's over-the-top speech that strikes a chord with Jaime. Madness has overtaken this city! I think Jamie's remembering the last time he struck down Madness in King's Landing, killing the Mad King, which we saw in Bran's flashback. So I don't think he's just rolling his eyes at Lord Tyrell here. He's thinking about whether he'll have to live with this decision for the rest of his life, just like he did with the nickname of Kingslayer. When Jamie and the Tyrells march up to the Sept, Marjorie's face fills with this look of shock and regret, like she's saying, "Ugh, oh, I wish I knew this was gonna happen. You gotta keep me in the loop, guys. But it's the reaction of the crowd I'm more interested in. Notice that when High Sparrow stands up for himself, the crowd argues back. And you don't have the authority to take them. That's right. That's right. 
The people of King's Landing are totally on the High Sparrow's side now. Like Arya in the theater audience, the Lannisters and the Tyrells are outnumbered by the masses who see the world totally different than they do. And after all of his little manipulations, the High Sparrow reveals his ace in the hole, a holy alliance between Tommen and the High Sparrow. Check out those new shields on the Kingsguard. That's a crown overlaid on a seven-pointed star, revealing that they're all under the High Sparrow's control now. Tommen even repeats the High Sparrow's words like a parrot. The crown, the crown and the faith, and the faith are the twin pillars of the world. Are the twin pillars upon which the world rests. But what's interesting here is that by backing down and saying Marjorie doesn't have to do her Walk of Atonement, the High Sparrow reveals his true nature. He compromises on his religious ideals because being faithful and pure and serving the gods isn't really his endgame. Power is his endgame. He's just a con man just like every other power player on this show. Moving on. So Jamie angrily strips off his armor as his son demotes him from Lord Commander of the King's Guard, and this is a direct parallel to the guy he replaced, former Lord Commander Sir Barristan and Selmy, who stripped off his cape back in season one. I shall die. I might. Now, obviously, this is a huge dishonor for Jamie, but it could be a blessing in disguise. Just like Sir Barristan, Jamie's more of himself when he's a knight out in the world rather than this glorified bodyguard stuck in King's Landing. Moving on to the twins, where we revisit Walder Frey for the first time since season three in the same hall where the Red Wedding went down. With the return of Brendan Blackfish and Edmer Tully, those loose Tully threads are indeed getting tied up. Also, Frey assuming that the Blackfish will surrender when he sees his nephew and the knife that killed Catelyn and Rob is the another example of the strength of family bloodlines. Of course, it's a false assumption by Walder Frey. Blackfish never really liked Edmer. Sorry, Edmer. Everyone hates you. Moving on. The fact that Jamie's headed to River Run to help the Freys means that we might see a reunion between Jamie and Brienne, who's headed to the same place. So just imagine a love triangle between Jamie Lannister, Brienne of Tarth, and Tormund Giant Spain. I thought that only existed in my fanfiction. Jamie also mentions Bronn in this scene, so hopefully we'll finally see him this season too. But let's talk about Cersei in this scene. Even though her plan to take down the Faith Militant blew up in her face, and her lover brother has been sent away from the city, she doesn't seem at all angry. Why is is that? It can't just be the fact that she has the mountain in her corner for this upcoming trial by combat. Notice how she strokes Joffrey's ring like a Bond villain petting his evil cat, and then this ring shows up again right in the center of the frame as she makes out with Jamie. This feels like a victory moment, like she has another trick up her sleeve. And I wonder what it could be. So earlier I mentioned that I had a theory about those wildfire images in Bran's vision, and Cersei is at the center of it. Cersei is almost obsessed with wildfire as the Mad King was. She ordered the pyromancers to create the stuff like crazy, adding to Eris's already huge stockpile, and at several points in the books, George R. R. Martin actually uses the word wildfire to describe Cersei's eyes and devilish smile. And let's not forget, Cersei hates King's Landing. She hates the commoners, she hates the Tyrells, she hates the Fate, she hates most of her living relatives, she hates Edmer, because everyone hates Edmer. Uh, she even hates the way the city smells. She said it stinks like garbage. And now she's been humiliated and boxed out. So what's the next move? I think Cersei is is going to use wildfire to burn this mother down. Now, I know that seems crazy. She would lose Tommen, her only living child. But remember, she's already expecting Tommen to die. That was according to the prophecy that all three of her kids would be in golden shrouds. But say somehow she can get Tommen out of the city. She already has Jamie out of the city. Those are the only two people she really cares about. So how great would it be to give the ultimate F you to the rotten city that she thinks took everything from her? And Cersei, if you could wait to torch the place until the sand snakes get there, that would be great. Okay, moving on. So we check back in with Bran, Mira, and Coldhands Benjen, who reveals himself to his nephew, and check out how Benjen drains the blood from this rabbit and makes Bran drink it. Why does he do that? I think this might help Bran control his green scene powers in some way, or maybe rabbit blood is just warm and delicious, I don't know. But notice how right when we get this big Stark family reunion, we get another image of blood. Again, this episode is reminding us of the power of family blood. Lines. Benjen also reveals that the Children of the Forest saved him by using the same kind of magic that they used to create the White Walkers. So how dead is he exactly? His face and hands are rotting, kind of like a white, but his mind and memories are all still there. When I last saw you, you were a boy. So Benjen isn't a white, and he isn't a white walker, and he wasn't brought back to life by the Lord of Light like Jon Snow and Beric Dondarrion were. So Benjen is a new kind of not quite dead person. Moving on. So I already started to break down this final scene in my preview section in our last video with the mountains blowing like leaves, just like Daenerys' recurring saying, When the seas go dry, when the mountains blow in the wind, 
like leaves. And how Dario calling her a conqueror could be a reference to her Targaryen ancestor, Aegon the Conqueror. It's interesting that Dario says they'll need a thousand ships easily. Which is conveniently the exact number of ships that Euron Greyjoy plans to build. Build me a thousand ships. They really are a match made in heaven, those two. The closing images show the amazing image of Daenerys straddling Drogon, who's bigger than ever, and I guess Daenerys just left her horse somewhere, and Daenerys rallies the Dothraki with this impassioned speech. All this imagery connects back to Bran's vision in the opening images in two ways. One, this shot of a flying dragon shadow as it flies overhead matches the shot of King's Landing. And also, these close-ups of the two holes in Drogon's mouth are probably where the fire comes out. Remember, dragon fire could be the primary weapon against the White Walkers, and it might be what Bran uses to, in the words of Daenerys' father, burn them all. This episode is titled Blood of My Blood, which is a Dothraki term of endearment. Akal uses it for his blood riders, and Jorah Mormont says it to Daenerys as she comes back through the flames in season one. Blood of my blood. Blood of my blood means family. The idea of strength and family, blood being thicker than water, flows through this episode like real blood through a bloodstream. The Starks found power in their family's bloodline, Bran through his uncle Benjen, the visions of his dead family family members, and Arya through the memory of her father. After reuniting with his family, Sam's Tarly power lives on through his ancestral sword, Heartsbane. Marjorie, I'm pretty sure, remains true to her Tyrell family ties, but Tommen has clearly betrayed his Lannister family, and I think his days might be numbered because of it. But Daenerys' bloodline comes out on top this episode. Even though the opening shots showed the death of the Targaryen dynasty on the Iron Throne with the death of the Mad King, Daenerys uses her family ties to rise to a more powerful powerful conqueror than the Mad King ever was, reuniting the two sides of her family into one powerful force, her new Dothraki blood riders, and the beloved dragon that she brought into the world, the blood of her blood. Okay, let's take a look at the preview for the next episode. Episode 7 is called The Broken Man, and a uh, warning, some of these predictions might end up being uh, spoilers, so skip to this time if you want to stay in the dark. So we see Jamie and Blackfish meeting uh, what looks like outside of River Run, and it's looking like the Blackfish is totally owning Jamie in this moment. So even though we see uh, the phrase use Edmer to try to force Blackfish to surrender, and they even use the same blade that killed uh, Rob and Catelyn, I'm guessing Walder Frey's plan isn't working out too well. We also see these shots of the Queen of Thorns chastising Cersei for her stupidity. I mean, it, it kind of is Cersei's fault for putting the High Sparrow into power and throwing everything into chaos. Uh, but it's interesting that both of these women are left in King's Landing, licking their wounds as they watch the young generations of their houses screw everything up. So I'm wondering what their next moves are. I've actually already speculated what I think Cersei's next move is. Okay, we also see Jon, Sansa, and Ser Davos on this recruiting mission to try to get the other uh, northern families on their side, so I think that will be a big part of next episode. It looks like we have the Mormonts of Bear Island. There's that bear sigil. And then the Glovers of Deepwood Mott, they have a glove sigil. So remember, we saw Roose Bolton receive a letter from the Mormonts last season that said they only honor one northern family, and its name is Stark. So that could be a promising sign for Sansa and Jon, but the Glovers, I think, are a different story. I remember Rob Stark let the Greyjoys sack Deepwood Mott during the War of the Five Kings, and the Glovers were one of the families that broke away to defend their hometown, so there might be some hard feelings between the Glovers and the Stark. I don't, I don't know if that will be as easy of a sell for them. Oh, so then we get this shot of the stolen Greyjoy ships outside of Volantis, which is pretty surprising because that's on the whole other side of Westeros. So Yara and Theon must have moved really fast to get there, and now now they're right around the corner from Marine, so I, I feel like even though their uncle Euron was the one who pledged this alliance with the Daenerys Targaryen, it, I think Yara and Theon might meet the Mother of Dragons well before he does. Okay, but this episode is called The Broken Man, and I'm not really sure who the Broken Man is referring to. Maybe it's Jaime with his prosthetic hand, and he's gonna go through some struggle. Uh, could be the mentally broken Edmer or Theon, or maybe Loris. Maybe Jon Snow is the Broken Man as he struggles to recruit the Northern houses and deal with the drama with all the wildlings. Maybe the broken man is someone else entirely. I don't know. Uh, let me know who you think the broken man is in the comments. Okay,
Okay, some lingering questions. What do you think the connection was between Burn the Mall and the White Walkers was in the opening images? I feel like those visions seemed super important and they were very carefully edited, so I would not be surprised at all if Burn the Mall comes back somehow, especially in relation to the White Walkers. Also, is Arya in trouble? Jack and Agar warned her last episode that either way, a new face would be added to the wall. And by blowing up her mission, she made a very powerful enemy. So are we gonna see Arya Stark's face on the wall in the House of Black and White? I don't know. And then what's next for Sam and the Sword Heartsbane? It's one of the few Valerian steel swords that exist in this universe, along with Jon Snow's Longclaw, Brienne's Oathkeeper, and wherever Lion's Tooth is. So I feel like Sam has to use that on the White Walker. I mean, why else would they give it to him? Okay, that's all I got. Uh, thanks for sticking with me this episode. Hopefully Philip is feeling better and he'll be back soon. But let me know what you think of all this in the comments. If you like this episode, please like and subscribe. Check out our other episode breakdowns. Uh, we covered a lot of theories in those, so if something wasn't in this episode, you can most certainly find it in one of those other past videos. You can follow us on Twitter at New Rockstars or follow Philip at Fimo with any thoughts or questions that you have on Game of Thrones. You can also hit me up on Twitter at EA Voss. And then you can also talk to Philip on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Fimo Knows. All right, thanks for watching, guys. Bye.